I've been avoiding reading this book for years now, but I realized that I can't keep hiding anymore and I need to face my fears and just do the damn thing. Hello everyone, my name is Maya and I am joined once again with my gorilla companion Harambe. And today we're going to be reviewing a book that has been living in my head rent free for the past three to four years, Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. Now I've spent the past four years of my life learning about anthropology, human history, human evolution, human genetics, human anatomy, basically all things human, hence my channel and all my videos. And I'd be lying if most of my friends hadn't at some point asked me what my opinions were on this book and what I thought about it as an anthropologist. I initially tried reading it last year because I thought it'd be interesting, but I eventually just gave up and put it down because I was starting to get really frustrated at some of the arguments that the author was trying to make. But I decided that I didn't give it a fair shot. So this year I decided to read it again thoroughly. and. And before anyone comes at me, I know I'm like years late with this review. The book initially came out in 2014. Like with almost everything, I am very fashionably late to this. But I still think this book is relevant to a lot of topics and discourse about the field of anthropology, human evolution, and history today. And a lot of influential people like Obama and Bill Gates say that this book is amazing, it's brilliant, it's eye-opening. So I figure I'd give it another critical read. As you can see, I've taken some notes and I took my time to read this book. It's a pretty hefty book. It's around 450 pages. I'm gonna start with the things that I liked about the book and then afterwards talk about the things that I didn't like about the book. For those of you that don't know, Sapiens is basically kind of like a brief history of humankind. It starts off with uh, how we evolved and how we went on to conquer the world and you know migrate out of Africa and uh, how we created stone tools to talking about how language came to be. The cognitive revolution and how our brains have basically expanded over the course of our evolution to discussing humanistic ideas like liberalism, talking about the advent of religion, Christianity, Islam, Judaism. It also goes into capitalism and communism and discourses about economy to finally getting us to a present day where he talks about where science is going in the future, the meaning of life, happiness, as well as what's next for homo sapiens. Now let's get into what I actually appreciated about the book. As an anthropologist and primarily a human evolutionary biologist, I am more familiar with certain aspects of the book than others. Where my expertise starts to kind of fall off a cliff is uh, when it comes to different aspects of human history that I probably haven't really gone into detail in since high school. That being said, I actually really liked how he talked about how capitalism shaped the world and how the economy shaped different wars and battles that occurred throughout history. I specifically enjoyed how he talked about how the stock market came to be, investing in companies. Uh, he talked about like the Mississippi crisis in France and how that like devastated the French economy. How the Dutch relied on uh, paying back loans with interest to finance their imperial exports. How these same loans negatively affected the Spanish. As someone that knows relatively little about economics, I think it's really interesting to explore history from an economic lens to see how money and finances change the course of events in history as we know it. So I thought that was really interesting. I like how we touched upon the awful treatment of animals in slaughterhouses and factory farms and how we're basically breeding these animals to just constantly produce milk or separating mothers from their children, putting these animals in these awful conditions. As a vegetarian, it really resonated with me when he acknowledged the harm and suffering that we have placed on millions of farm animals animals today and the effect that's having on our environment. I also really enjoyed the discussion on happiness at the end when he talked about what defines happiness and kind of like how to even go about measuring happiness. Harari brings up Buddhism and points out that Buddhism kind of focuses on instead of chasing these feelings and chasing these like euphoric highs and lows just to kind of accept that life is just cycles of suffering and happiness and to just get 
used to feeling and experiencing those things instead of trying to chase those highs and lows. I also really enjoyed when he explained how money came to be, how coinage came to be, how it was something that we all had to kind of believe in uh, as a universal concept. It was almost religious in the sense where people had to believe in like a higher order of things so that they could conduct business or pay for services or do whatever they needed to do. It's things like these that you never think about that you just kind of take for granted. And while I already knew a lot about how written language came to be, I still thought it was really cool how he touched upon how written language evolved as a way to keep track of certain stocks of certain things or inventories and such and how he talked about the ancient Sumerians and the use of written language to keep track of their inventories. Finally, I thought that he had a kind of nuanced take on British imperialism. I have a lot of opinions about British imperialism that could probably warrant like an hour long video about it, but I thought it was really interesting when he talked about how, in a sense, British colonies have kind of benefited from British imperialism. As horrible as it was, and it was horrible, these colonies ended up adopting a lot of democratic and liberal doctrines from imperialism that they probably wouldn't have otherwise kept. In a Now let's get into the issues with Sapiens because, oh boy, are there some issues with this book. Honestly, the first half when he's talking about our evolution is kind of hard for me to sit through because it kind of frustrates me as someone who spent the last four years of my life studying our evolution. Harari gets a lot of things right, but he also oversimplifies and overgeneralizes a lot and this frustrates me. On page five, he says, our nearest living relatives include chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. The chimpanzees are the closest. Just six million years ago, a single female ape had two daughters. One became the ancestor of all chimpanzees, the other is our own grandmother. This is not what evolution looks like. And this is actually a huge issue because in my debates with people that don't believe in evolution, they always bring up the point that it's impossible for a chimpanzee to just give birth to a human. And this paragraph basically essentially is trying to say that. It's trying to say that, oh, just one random day, six million years ago, a female chimpanzee gave birth to two people. One was a human and one was a chimpanzee. And this is such a flawed view of our evolution that I don't even know where to start with this. First of all, this is not how evolution works. There's two types of evolution, macroevolution and microevolution. Macroevolution is the kind of evolution that takes place over hundreds of thousands of years. And saying something as simplistic as a chimpanzee just gave birth to two people that day. One of them was our grandmother and one of them was a chimpanzee is so simplistic and does not encapsulate the gradual, slow process of evolution. It would have been much better if he said something along the lines of chimpanzees and humans shared a common ancestor six million years ago, and then we eventually diverged into our own separate species. I understand that he's trying to make our evolution seem more digestible and understandable by a general audience. This sentence will inherently cause a lot of misconceptions about evolution and might lead people to think that our evolution was as simple as a chimp giving birth to the grandmother of the entire sapien species when it's not actually that simple at all. On page nine, he talks about how we grew bigger brains by saying, archaic humans paid for their large brains in two ways. Firstly, they spent more time in search of food. Secondly, their muscles atrophied. Like a government diverting money from defense to education, humans diverted energy from biceps to neurons. Now, he doesn't really seem to link any kind of sources for this. And over the years of all my readings, I've never come across a hypothesis that states that we diverted energy from building muscles to building a brain. One of my previous videos talked about how a decrease in gut size could have been correlated to an increase in brain size, but this is not mentioned by Harari at all. And I think it would have actually been a more credible hypothesis to put in this book. In my opinion, this is really oversimplified and he makes it sound like it's fact when it's not. And the fact that he doesn't even list any sources for this is kind of worrying. Like, I don't even know where he got this idea from. And even in my classes, I've never heard of this theory that we got bigger brains because we spent more time searching for food and our muscles atrophied. It's just so overly simplistic that it doesn't come across as a solid argument. And just a minor note, on pages 12 and 13, Harari says that, having so recently been one of the underdogs of the savannah, we are full of fears and anxieties over 
over our position, which makes us doubly cruel and dangerous. Many historical calamities, from deadly wars to ecological ca catastrophes, have resulted from this overhasty jump. This statement stems from a general misunderstanding of evolution. A species collectively does not remember memories from hundreds of thousands of years ago. And this brings me to one of the biggest issues that I have with sapiens. The overgeneralization and popularization of science. I understand what Harari is trying to do. He's trying to kind of water down the science to make it more understandable to a general audience. And I think that's great. I think what we definitely need is for scientists to be more transparent and communicative about what they're doing and explaining complex aspects of our evolution that many people don't understand and struggle with. And I commend him for his efforts to do so. But what I have a problem with is the fact that Yuval Noah Harari is a historian. He's not a scientist. And I think that's abundantly clear when you're reading the first couple chapters of Sapiens. I'm sorry, but the man doesn't really seem to have many sources for the arguments that he's making and the way that he explains these scientific concepts kind of tells me that he generally has a very shaky understanding of our evolution, which I mean, is kind of expected if he's a historian. This sensationalized rhetoric around our evolution is okay if it's with the aim of trying to bring more knowledge and awareness about our history and our evolution to a general audience, but I just don't want that audience to think that evolution works as simplistically as he says it does or that because we got big brains because we started looking for more food and we stopped bulking up and getting more musclier. It's not really that simple. And I think it's his duty as the author of this book that purports to be the history of humankind to at least do a little bit more research or have a little bit more fact checking going on and to make sure that he actually has reputable sources behind the arguments that he's making before publishing a book that would end up being a universal bestseller and be read by the likes of Obama and Bill Gates. On page 25, Harari tries to make the argument that our language evolved as a way of gossiping. Now he lists one source for this, which I guess is more than usual because for a lot of these arguments, there's nary a source for them. And I found it so generalized and really unconvincing. I'm sure there's an argument to be made Made that you know gossiping about other individuals in a group could have led to us kind of having a complex language but it's just so hastily rushed over and it seems so unconvincing especially when there's only one source to back up his general statement that language evolved from gossiping there's so many theories as to why language evolved it's not my specialty but I'm sure there's a linguist that could go into detail about how attributing language to the need to gossip isn't necessarily a solid argument on page 280 Harari tries to make an argument about how Christianity didn't really allow for independent scientific explorations or the pursuit of knowledge. He says Christianity did not forbid people to study spiders, but spider scholars, if they were any in medieval Europe, had to accept their peripheral role in society and the relevance of their findings to the eternal truths of Christianity. No matter what a scholar might discover about spiders or butterflies or Galapagos finches, that knowledge was little more than trivia, with no bearing on the fundamental truth of society, politics, and economics. I feel like this argument is just fatally flawed. If you look at a lot of the most important and influential scientists to this day, a lot of them were actually devout Christians. Gregor Mendel, through his crossbreeding of different flowers, discovered many rules about heredity and inheritance of genes and traits. Michael Faraday was a devout member of the church who discovered electromagnetic induction. Isaac Newton, a devout Protestant who was basically the father of physics today. So to say that these religions never really encouraged the uh, exploration of other scientific topics is just false. Christianity definitely had a role in kind of deeming people heretics if they stepped outside the realm of the fact that God was the creator of everything, but a lot of scientific areas actually did flourish under a Christian rule. On page 403, he talks about how states and markets have basically led to the degradation of the family unit and how we basically went from strong familiar bonds to a heavy dependence on the individual. And once again, I just don't agree with this at all. I mean, the new nuclear family unit still has a heavy influence on society today. Especially in the 50s when we saw a rise of the nuclear family with a wife that cooked and cleaned, a husband that went out to work, and usually two or three kids. So this idea that the family unit was basically just destroyed with the advent of capitalism, markets, and the state fails to be convincing. And even though I liked his discussions on capitalism and how the market shaped the world, on page 365 when he, when he talks about how the Greeks rebelled against the Ottoman Empire, and how the London Stock Exchange basically led to the Greeks winning the war. 
This is very, very simplified and a quick Wikipedia Google search will show you that the Greeks were never really freed after this and still faced decades of turmoil. And it wasn't as simple as the British just kind of interfering and causing a victory. After I finished this book, I decided to read a bunch of five-star reviews and also some very critical reviews of Sapiens just to get a general idea of what the consensus was by other people who had read this book. And one review written by Sierra Hallpike touches on an argument that Harari made that I also found kind of interesting as well. Harari tries to make the argument that agriculture ruined us and we basically went from one form of slavery to the next and how we didn't domesticate, we, we domesticated us. And now I can see how a lot of the points Harari is making about how agriculture was detrimental to our general health, how it forced us into hours of labor, how we were barely fed and hardly nourished, how our diets started to kind of look very homogenous and lack any diversity. I can see how all of that kind of points to towards the idea that the agricultural revolution wasn't so amazing after all. But Hallpike also points out a lot of the benefits of the agricultural revolution, like the fact that humans could stay in permanent settlements for a longer amount of time, meaning that they didn't have to wander around aimlessly day in and day out. This means that they could focus on forming groups and civilizations that would eventually lead to the major civilizations that came about after this period. Also, agriculture allowed us to have a food surplus, which meant that we would have more food than mountains to feed, which ended up leading to a diversification of labor. The fact of the matter is hunter-gatherers pretty much only ate what they could and basically just spent their days searching for food. But when we started farming, there was a food surplus, meaning that we could spend more time on other activities or other pursuits instead of just spending all of our time looking for food. And when we finally made that switch over and started to focus on other things like public infrastructure or water management or sewage control or architecture, we could finally expand past the need to just survive and think about how to actually grow and manage a settlement or civilization. So I don't know if I necessarily agree with the argument that the agricultural revolution basically just ruined us. I think that regardless of how you put it, the agricultural revolution was still that, a revolution. Maybe it wasn't the best thing to happen to us, but it certainly was not the worst. And finally, in the final chapter, he talks about kind of creating a better homo and how we can kind of pick and choose different genes to make the perfect human. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, he's grossly oversimplifying the nature of genetics. It's not as simple or easy as just picking the perfect genes and creating the perfect human. Harari forgets the interaction between genes and the environment and nature versus nurture. Even if you have the ideal genes, if your environment is not conducive to expressing the right genes or turning on the right genes, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to become like an apex species. Studies have shown that gene expression is a lot of the time a result of the environment that you grow into and the factors that you are surrounded with when you're born. It's not as simple as just picking and choosing what genes you want and then just having it be expressed. So this is another fundamental misunderstanding that Harari has about genetics. Overall, I think he overgeneralizes a lot of science and history. And I think he also popularizes a lot of scientific concepts without having a really good solid foundation for these concepts. Another thing that I noticed is that the book is still very Eurocentric. He honestly hardly touches on Chinese scientists and explorers or uh, Arabic mathematicians or South American tribes and societies that evolved complex written systems. How can you purport that your book is a brief history of humankind when most of your discussion is just limited to European philosophers, thinkers, and historical events. I guess I'm just tired of people calling European history world history. A lot of this book is just European history. And in a sense, I understand that he's trying to kind of accumulate the biggest and most important events of our history. And a lot of those are events that took place in Europe for whatever reason. But at least be open and honest with that. Or at least, I don't know, try to talk about other civilizations and other countries in more detail than talking about Admiral Zheng He's expeditions or the Chinese invention of gunpowder. The only context with which Harari actually talks about other countries outside of Europe is to just talk about how they were conquered by Western countries. When these countries have their own rich histories, the only glimpse of their history that we get from in this book is to talk about how the Indians were imperialized by Great Britain, how the aboriginals were basically exterminated by the British, and how the Spanish basically brutally massacred the Aztecs. He has a whole section about the evolution of time. Why not talk about the Mayan calendar? He has a whole section about numbers and how math came to be. Why not talk about how Arabics and Indians actually invented the first numerical system as well as the number zero? He talks about 
portrayed and how this was so important for the world and capitalism and economy, but then seemingly leaves out the Chinese silk trade, how that was one of the biggest trading systems to ever exist in human history. I understand that you can't encompass all the history of humankind in one book, but don't claim that it's a history of all humans when it's really just a history through the lens of European imperialism and colonialism, with a little sprinkling of scientific misunderstanding. Overall, this overgeneralization of history, popularization of science, Eurocentric history, and general inaccuracies and lack of evidence for a lot of the arguments he makes makes me worried that this is a hugely popular book that many people love and adore. In general, I just felt like the book also lacked structure. I felt like a lot of the sections were all over the place and kind of rambly, like he just kind of started pouring out all of his thoughts for different arguments and then switched up and then completely went to a different argument. It was kind of hard to follow his train of logic and reasoning at times. While I don't think he got anything completely so wrong that it's like egregious, I do think that this book would have seriously benefited from some fact checking and from having a more sturdier references section. Now, I'm not a booktuber, so I don't really have like a formal rating system for books that I read, but I would say out of three stars, I'd probably have to give it like a 2.5. I'm sorry, don't sue me, please. But as an anthropologist, I just can't look over some of the glaringly oversimplified arguments that he presents as fact in this book. I know this review is going to be received a little bit controversially because this is a well-loved book, but this book has been haunting me since I started studying anthropology and got really interested in our evolution. And so I decided to just bite the bullet and give it a try. Even if you like the book, I want you to be aware of the fact that some of the information in this book isn't 100% accurate and shouldn't be taken as so. But that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys liked this video, please give it a like. What are your opinions on the book if you've read it? Let me know in the comments down below. Please subscribe if you like my videos and if you want to know more about all things human. And follow my Instagram for updates on videos that I plan on making next. Now, you've got to excuse me because Rambe is actually about to give birth to a human now. And we've got a lot to do to prepare for that. But nonetheless, I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!